<laughs> I wonder if we're come on then. Hey up, it's Steve from that old Yorkshire geek, and welcome to Magnificent Mondays, episode 38. Uh, Forbidden Planet, we're doing Forbidden Planet, a classic from 1956. Let's make sure we are going. I hope we are. Yes, we're going on YouTube. Well, hopefully we're going on Rumble. Let me refresh this. Don't know why it doesn't just start. And come on, Rumble. Come on, Rumble. Oh, for God's sake. Uh, yes, and we're live on Twitch as well as. Right. Um, yes, we are. Come on, Rumble. We're going to stop playing silly buggers. Rumble's dead temperamental, isn't it? Proper is. Right, yes, we're going on Rumble. Right. Right, so, anyway, Josh Temple's here, never fear. Maddie's here, harpoon at the ready. We're going to need these for these monsters from the id. Forbidden for some, says Wind Grace, in that sort of a voice, probably. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, I've been there, it was okay. Forbidden Planet, as in Altair 4, or the, um, the um, Geeky Store, which I've never been to. I've never been to a Forbidden Planet Geeky Store. I think the nearest one here is maybe, I don't know, to be honest. Is it the one in Leeds? I think it might have used to be, but I never went to it. Anyway, so uh, let's get some info about Forbidden Planet. Uh, by the way, let's get some, let's look at some pictures before we start. Eh? So we'll pop them. There we go. So I'll just go through, scroll through some pictures. We all know the story of this film, don't we? Um, uh, the C 50s United Planets Cruiser C 57D travels to the planet of Altair for. Um, on a mission to find out what happened to the colonists that went there 20 years earlier. Um, Leslie Nielsen, in a, a dramatic role, he didn't really start doing comedies until Airplane in 1980, but before that, he was more known as a dramatic actor. Um, he's the captain of the ship. Um, uh, they go, they arrive there, they find out, you know, what, something disastrous has happened and they, they encounter Morbius and Robbie the Robot and monsters from the id and all that stuff and a beautiful young girl um, and all that jazz. So there we go. So look at some pictures. Well, we go, oh, look, there's a, um, I don't know, that's supposed to be. It's a representation of the monster from the id, but we'll get there. Anyway, right, so. So... Uh, Windgrace says, perhaps the real forbidden planet is Earth. Yes, perhaps it is. Perhaps it is. Why are the pictures so bloody small? Um, uh, cool effects in this film. Amazing effects for the time, 1956. Done traditionally. Obviously no CG back then, so they're all models and stuff. And animation. They've got Walt Disney artists. It's an MGM film, but they've got Walt Disney artists to come in and do the animations and stuff like that. Uh, which is cool, and I think the backgrounds are done by you know renowned space artist Chesley Bonestell, I think. Uh, but anyway, uh, ah, uh, everybody knows it's based. Well, not everybody, but everybody knows it's based uh, loosely on Shakespeare's The Tempest. I'm saying as though I know. Obviously, I've never read Shakespeare's. I don't think I've ever read any Shakespeare. Um, but uh, anyway, right. So. Uh, let's get some information. Uh, as I said, starring uh, Leslie Nielsen, uh, directed by Fred M. Wilcox, and I think up to this point his most notable film, maybe his most notable films ever, are this and Lassie Come Home. Um, uh, stars Leslie Nielsen, Walter Pidgeon, uh, Anne Francis, Warren Stevens, and Robbie, comma, the robot. Not Robbie the robot, Robbie... Other robots. So there we go. <laughs> Got to remember that comma. Uh, had a budget of one point, well, just under two million dollars, which was a lot back in 1956, uh, and it just about broke even. Um, it, I think it was a bit of a disappointment. It, it, you know, it's it's, it's a classic, um, but at the time, which is common, isn't it? Uh, in movies, uh, it's, be, you know, it's become a classic film over the years, but at the time, you know, it did. It just about broke even, so it, it was a bit of a disappointment. It wasn't a box office smash, which is surprising, to be completely honest. Um, but anyway, uh, it's also famous for its uh, electronic musical score by, I'll let you know, because I can't remember, Beebe and Louis Barron. Um, it's not called music. They're not, they weren't allowed to call it music by Beebe and Louis Barron. It was electronic tonalities, because the um, the musicians' union 
got onto MGM and said, you know, it's not music. They're not playing instruments. They're doing um, uh, electronic things and going and doing weird noises. So they weren't allowed to call it music. Um, so it wasn't, you know, eligible to be up for an Oscar or anything like that, an Academy Award. Uh, where were it filmed? I think it was filmed at uh, the uh, Culver City Studios, I do believe. Does it say? Does it say? Uh, I don't say. But I think it was. I'm sure it was. And Robbie the Robot himself was the most expensive single prop ever made for a film at uh, $125,000. Um, so that and these, you know, today that would have been about a million dollars, but. That's small change for films these days, isn't it? Uh, Robbie also popped up um, that a year later in a film, The Invisible Boy, which were kind of, not in the film itself, but I think in the publicity, they kind of made out like a sequel to um, the Forbidden Planet, even though it was set in the 20th century. They tried to say that some time travel shenanigans went on and Robbie the Robot went back in time and it even uh, told us that um, the C-57D... Uh, came back to Earth in 2309, the early 24th century, so it took a while to get home from Altair 4, which is only 17 light years away. Right, is that it? Is that, is that, is that enough information? Can we get on with the film now? People have probably been shouting at me because I couldn't see me, me the chat. Uh, Wingrace says, I read The Tempest. It's fine, I guess, because, you know, he's, he's, he's one of the... You know, he reads Shakespeare. I bet he sits... Bloody reading Shakespeare, you know, when he's just relaxing, probably with a pipe and all that. <laughs> Did Robbie ever work in law enforcement? Robbie Cop versus Robocop. He should have done, shouldn't he? He should have done. Right, so uh, let's get rid of that. There's enough images. Um, where are we? Bear with me. Right, let's get the film up. As usual, we'll not be uh, watching the film because I'll get into trouble with YouTube. Uh, just bear with me. I don't know if it's going to come on. Is it going to come on? Yeah, I can pause it now. Because uh, I get into trouble with YouTube. So, uh, we'll be watching a series of stills and we'll, I'll try and remember what I've learned about it. I've put a, There's a link, there's a, a documentary. I think it was on the. I think it's on. It could be on this, <laughs> uh, the HD DVD, which I couldn't watch because I haven't got HD DVD player anymore. But there's a nice documentary about the making of Forbidden Planet. It's, it's just a lot of the actors just remembering what they did back in the day. Uh, this has also got in the Invisible Boy with it, and I can't bloody watch it. Anyway, uh, I forgot what I was saying now. Uh, oh, I put a link for the documentary in the in the description. Um, so there we go. Uh, I'll try and remember other things I know about the film. Uh, you don't have a 360 anymore. I do, but it's in a box underneath loads of other things. <laughs> I could dig it out, but I just can't be bothered. I just can't be bothered. Anyway, right. Um, what else is there? Oh, right, don't forget, before we start, like and subscribe, share the videos, drop a comment, hit the notification bell if you're subscribed already. Uh, super chat, super thanks, blah blah blah, uh, and all that jazz. Right, uh, I've said done that. We're live on YouTube, Rumble, and Twitch. I've said all that, haven't we? Right, and Joshua Kanapke has arrived. He has arrived with a little accent on the e. Oh, ah, yes, and, and buy a shirt. Oh, ah, yes, and uh, I've got to do the old. Um, uh, I keep forgetting about uh, doing my uh, Patreon. Shout out to buddy Patreons. I've still only got one Archmage Frey, that mysterious man from Twitch who may make an appearance, I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, check out my Patreon, I put exclusive stuff up and other things as well, uh, and all that jazz. And I've also got a store, if you go on to uh, YouTube, there's a store where I sell t-shirts, and well I don't, Spreadshirt does, t-shirts and mugs and bags and i don't know all with my silly logo slapped on and other things uh and all that jazz um uh, i've actually ordered i've ordered some t-shirts to see what they're like so but it, they don't just send you one for free i've got to bloody pay for them myself so anyway uh the quickening is a lie <laughs> is it okay <laughs> 
are you a highland are you an, an immortal anyway because there can be only one right right let's get on with this film i make myself titchy tiny uh how do i do that i keep forgetting i keep forgetting which one it is is it that one no nope. always pick the wrong one it's that one right so let's get this film up here it is there it is there's good old leo the lion uh, by the way uh, if you look, there he is, Leo the Lion. I'll just play him. Look, good. oh for God's sake! I pressed the wrong bloody button. There we go. They were giving it all that look, going ah and and ah like that. And then later on, when we see the id monster, spoilers, uh, he's doing that. <laughs> he's the id monster, the base, essentially base the id monster uh, on good old Leo the Lion, the MGM Lion. Right, off we go. Uh, the Forbidden Planet, here we go. We're hearing all the electronic tonalities now. Um, the cool 3D, although I don't think it was ever released in 3D, but a 3D effect title sequence. Um, this is where we learn in a minute after the credits. Uh, let's get past the credits. Uh, it's still filmed in Cinemascope. Uh, there special effects by Arnold Gillespie, Warren Newcomb, Irving G. Reese, and Joshua Medor, through courtesy of Walt Disney Productions. They'll have done all the animations and stuff. The blaster effects. They call them blasters. George Lucas probably saw this and thought, cool name, I'm going to steal that. Uh, what else? Um, he did the blasters and he did the, oh, basically all the animated stuff and um, stuff that weren't models. So he did the mon Id Monster and other things, other animations. Uh, electronic tonalities, Louis and B.B. Barron, I think they're husband and wife uh, musicians, uh, which caused a bit of a stir at the time. And there we go, directed by Fred M. Wilcox. Then we get a, uh, there we go, um, we get a little voiceover. Um, I don't know if this is done by uh, the fellow that does the voice of... Um, Robbie the Robot, I could be wrong, but anyway, there we go, in the final decade of the 21st century, oh, hang on, hang on, I forgot something, just a minute, do, do, do. there you go, there you go, you can see it now, uh, final decade of the 21st century, man had reached the moon, or something like that, he says, there we go, men and women in rocket ships landed on the moon, in the, what was that, by the, by the when of the 20, in the final decade, so, according to Forbidden Planet, we didn't land on the moon until the 2090s. Unbelievable. Be beat it by over 100 years. Anyway. Uh, no assembly required. All are here. Yes, the Council of Joshers. Uh, an honorary member of the Council. <laughs> hey... Anyway, so here we get a first look at the um, uh, rockets just landed on the moon, and then by 2200, they'd colonise the planets and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then, but now we set sometime in the 23rd century. There we go, they reach the other planets of our solar system, and then we get f did faster than light travel. They go, the discovery of hyperdrive. That's another thing that George Lucas stole into for Star Wars. Uh, but here's, the, here's the C57D through which the speed of light was first attained and later greatly surpassed. <clears throat> uh, so it's humans that's flying around in flying saucers in this. Uh, we would see the words C-57D again in um, the film Serenity on the planet Miranda. Uh, you see it on the side of a ship, C-57D. Um, uh, George, uh, not George Lucas, uh, Gene Roddenberry were also inspired by this film. So, you know, so you see a lot of things in this, you know, repeated or emulated in Star Trek, the original series. Um, just watched the original War of the Worlds yesterday. Good times. That's, that is an amazing film. Uh, one of my favourites. I'm sure we'll get there <laughs> with that one. On Magnificent Mondays, especially The Cage, yes. Uh, very especially the cage, because that's basically this film, isn't it, really? <laughs> it's not far off. It's not far off. Right, more than a year. What does it say, actually, um, when this is? Um, just bear with me. No, it doesn't say, does it? Sometime in the... It must be the late 23rd century, if, the, if an invisible boy, they say, the C-57D, arrived back at Earth... 
uh, in 2309. So there must be some time in the late 23rd century. Anyway, right, so here we meet the crew of the good ship C-57D. Why did they give it a name? I don't know. Um, uh, I'm going to have to try and remember the bloody names now. Um, Captain Adams, Lieutenant Farnham. Uh, I think he's like the, the executive officer uh, and various crew members. Um I think he's the astrogator as well as the first officer because he does say astrogator to crew or something like that. So he's like the navigator. Um, but they're getting ready to decelerate. That's what DC fix stands for, deceleration. And um, so they're going to decelerate soon. So they've all got to get into basically transporter pads. So that's what they're going to do. Um, this is, um, oh, I can't remember his name now. Oh, got to check that now. Uh, played by Richard Anderson, who we know from Six Million Dollar Man. Uh, Chief Quinn, that's it, Chief Quinn. Uh, he's like the science officer or the mechanic or engineer, something like that. Um, there is a thing in, in, in the trivia on IMDb, it says, in the, it says the ship's clock when they arrive at Altair Fort says 1701 or 1701, which is where Gene Roddenberry got the number for the USS Enterprise. I've looked, and I can't bloody find it anyway. I've looked on these numbers here and that number there. I can't find 1701 anywhere. But anyway. Right, so here we go. They're getting ready to decelerate. So they're all getting ready. They all run into this, this area with the transporter pads. And as they decelerate, it's obviously some sort of, uh, what they call it, um, um, <laughs> what they got? Inertial damper, something like that, uh, as they decelerate, so they don't get squished into mush. But uh, it's never good. They get surrounded by a force field, <laughs> and all the lights change colours. You can hear a beeping as well, and it says the ship's beeper will sound ten times, so you hear that as well. Uh, if you see anything that says 1701, give us a shout. <laughs> I never noticed it. Watch me land right on it now with these pauses. Anyway, so they're all they're all rubbing the necks as they all um, get off. Look, 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 do that a lot, don't they? In in sci-fi, in like fifties and sixties sci-fi, when they do something, rubbing the neck. They do it in the cage, uh, Star Trek: The Cage, when they beam down to um, I forgot the name of the planet. The planet, um, the Doc Doctor, that like, does that. Oh God, blimey! That transporting's a pain, isn't it? It makes me neck ache. Ick. Anyway, right, so they've arrived at Altair for uh, 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 a main sequence star. As I said, 17 light years from Earth. It's taken them a year to get there. Presumably they've arrived from Earth. So they're travelling many times the speed of light. And then uh, Doc, Doc Ostro, uh, played by Warren Stevens. Um... um it says, it's getting warm in here. I don't think it would work like that, <laughs> would it? You know, they'd have, like, they'd have like a, a proper temperature control inside the ship, wouldn't they? So just because they're there. Um, so the captain gets kind of cross and he says, ooh, Jerry, I think it's Jerry. Um, what are you doing? And Jerry says, Lieutenant Farnham says, um, there she is, Altair, right on the money. So there we go. There you go, right on the nose, Skipper. Uh, by the way, there's... Oh, I missed him. There, there he is. There's the cook in the background. We'll see more of him later. <laughs> that is the cook. Because he's got an apron and a cook's hat on. Don't know how they call... Don't call him chef. Uh, meanwhile, the ship makes its own eclipses look. Uh, just like the one that you had in America this last week or so. Um... It's earlier when he sees, says we'll reach DC point by 1701. Did he, does he say that earlier? All oh, right, I missed that bit, you see. I missed that. Let's go back and see if we can find it then. See if we can see that. Because I did actually see that DC thing. There we go, see DC stations. Uh, DC fix. Oh, wow, uh, yes, there we go. There we go. So he actually says it. It's not actually on the screen. He actually he says it, doesn't he, in, in words. 
All right, fair enough. Ship's clock. Deceleration point. But it actually says in the trivia, the MDB trivia, that as they enter orbit of Altair 4, but that's not that, is it? This is uh, entering the system, aren't they? the deceleration. So, but anyway. Right, thanks for that, Wind Grace. Putting me right again. <laughs> Anyway, where were we? Right, get through this again. So they've arrived at Altair for... Uh, well, arrived at the Altair system. Uh, watched a nice eclipse. There it is. Ooh, lovely. Um, so they're heading for Altair for now. Uh, we're getting ready for brakes, whatever that is. I presume that's some more like deceleration. They call it brakes. Uh, oh, look, have a look at Altair for. There it is in the distance uh, it tells everybody you know just a uh, gravity is something like 0.8 or something of earth so uh, uh, adjust your equipment accordingly so here we go the ship uh, arrives I, I think that's supposed to be uh, Altair 4 because the ship kind of although it goes round in an arc if you watch because um, you've got the stars in the background but that's also moving as well as though it's closer to us um, anyway so I think that's supposed to be there it is Altair 4. No moon that we can see. I don't know if we see a moon in the sky. We'll have to wait and see, won't we? But uh, um, They mention religion a couple of times in this film. The Lord sure makes some beautiful worlds. Pardon me. And he does. Um, have they done the brakes? It says astrogator to uh, whatever. Is it? Uh, there we go. To crew, stand by to change flux. And I always thought he said change plugs. Um, you know, when, the, when I watched this before the advent of subtitles and stuff like that, I always thought he said stand by to change plugs. Because I was imagining some technical thing going on where the. Because all the technology in this film, it's very, you know, it's very uh, analog and uh, switches and stuff like that. So I thought something was going to happen and they were going to change something to slow the ship down. But it says change flux. Whatever that means. <laughs> Maybe the flux capacitor. Maybe that's why Robbie the Robot travels back in time. Who knows? Anyway, here goes the ship. That's a cool effects for 1956. Cool effects. They even knew the Earth was, the planets were round back in those days. Oh, I hear Cookie moaning, saying another new planet with nothing to do except throw rocks at tin cans and we've got to bring our own tin cans. There we go. No beer, no women, no pool parlours. Hey, stop moaning. The crew is supposed to be super intelligent and super fit and all this stuff. You know, the cream of the crop, according to uh, according to the captain. Um, so every big sci-fi franchise came from this, even Back to the Future. Yes, it did. Even Back to the Future. <laughs> it all began with Forbidden Planet. The uniforms get reused in uh, a few films as well. We saw one in um, or two in um, the Time Machine a few weeks ago, didn't we? Um, we saw them there. Uh, right, so there he is telling the crew that they're entering orbit, and from this, from now, all crew will wear a sidearm. So there we go. Uh, the scanning the planet. There's no radio signals. It says they may be missing some individual stru structures, but there's no roads or dams or anything like that. There's no sign of civilization on the surface. Um, but then they get radar scanned. Um, they're also sponsored by Target. Yes, on the the things on there. Right? <laughs> uh, there you go. No cities, ports, roads, bridges, or dams. Uh, hang on, hang on. Oh, no sign of civilization at all. But then they get radar scanned. It says it's coming from an area approximately 20 miles square. It says 20 miles. Uh, anyway. But uh, then they get a voice message coming through. Uh, this is from Morbius. Uh, to, they're glad to hear that there's somebody alive down there. Uh, they the look him up. Edward Morbius was a member of the Bellerophon crew, which was the ship that carried the colonists or science party, whatever they were supposed to be, uh, 20 years earlier. Um, but he's not happy for them to be there. J.J. Abrams. Oddly enough, I watched a review earlier on. 
<laughs> from uh, Retro Nerd Girl. Uh, she did the review of this. Uh, I meant to put that link in the description and I forgot. Um, and she accidentally called him J.J. Abrams. And I had a laugh. I had a laugh about it. Uh, it could be, for all we know. I think it's I think it's John Abram. I think it's J. Abrams, isn't it? I think. Um, does it does it tell us? Does it tell us? Let's have a look. Uh, no, it just says Commander Adams. I thought it was Captain. Um, well, where is he? Yeah, John J. Adams. Yes, he is J. J. Oh, Adams, not Abrams. Did I say Abrams? Whatever. Whatever. If I said Abrams, I'm sorry. It's Adams, isn't it? Anyway. J.J. Adams. Anyway, so they're contacted by uh, Do uh, Dr. Morbius from down on the planet, and he's very relieved that you know, they're here to, uh, basically, we're here to rescue you, uh, and all that jazz. But he doesn't want them to be there. He says, we're, we're all fine. Everything's lovely. Go away. So they said, no, we've, we've got to land. Give us landing coordinates. And says, well... If you land, I won't be responsible for anything that happens to you. So, whatever. So, uh, they have standard charts. So, they must all use the same uh, charts that they used on the Bellerophon, which is reasonable. So, they're going to land in uh, somewhere out in the desert. But uh, So, oh, there you go. Until further notice, all hands will wear sidearms. There, we've got a cool shot of um, the... Uh, the, the, the ship coming in. It does have moons. It does have moons after all. There we go. So in it comes. Uh, it's a nice model shot. We see its shadow on the, the ground coming up. Did I see something weird happen then? Oh, a bit of a shadow there. Is that... Um, so I just noticed there on the... On the obviously, you know, painted backdrop. But there's like a shadow there. Is it from something maybe... Where a crane is something that's holding the string for that. Is that, that what we can see there? Sorry, I'm just sorry for spoiling the uh, <laughs> the immersion, but I can just see it there. I've just noticed it there on the mountain. Something there. Anyway, whatever. So in it comes, and it comes there, we've got shadow arrives. Look, it comes into land, and then we have this cool shot of it. Like there, we've got like some sort of force field that it's coming into land um, with. Again, animated by the Disney animators, and uh, uh, but as you notice, um, uh, you might think it's the shadow that it's casting down on the floor, which you know maybe it is. But we see it later on. We, see it, we learn it's it's actually not a shadow. This beam or whatever it is has actually burnt all the ground around underneath the ship. But anyway, the middle section comes down, and I like as it's we see all this bit is spinning like that, but. Um, then suddenly it just it just disappears, it just turns solid, uh, just all of a sudden, uh, when the legs come down, the uh, well the ladders come down, uh, there you go, <laughs> it just stops spinning, just boom, off, but uh, so it matches that I suppose. Right, so there we go, out they come. Uh, and then as, as they're getting their bearings, looking at the sky, and I think Doc Ostro says, uh, a man could learn to love this. Like, it's not exactly nice, is it? It's <laughs> not exactly the Garden of Eden, is it? But uh, anyway, Joshua says, that's no moon. Uh, it's very rarely uh, actually a moon. Uh, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> um, but anyway... Uh, but as they're waiting, something appears. Um, oh, ah, yes, he's... Uh, where are we? Uh, right, they get the tractor ready so they can go to where Dr. Morbius is. Um, there you go. Check the command mic. So he goes, what he's wearing there is the command mic, and it's got a camera in it, and we see this repeated in uh, Phantom Menace. Uh, Captain Panaka in the Phantom Menace uses one of those in Star Wars. So there we go. It's Morbin time. Yes, it will be soon. <laughs> uh, so he's checking the command mic. Um, where are we? Did it? Did the? There we go. They say I see that in Phantom Menace because George Lucas has done, had an original bloody idea in his life. <laughs> uh, there we go. And now here comes something's approaching in a, a 
and there's a dusty sound cloud or whatever. It's like something from Michael Benteen's Potty Time, which was a a kids show when I, when I was young. Um, they used to have this segment in it. Um, it was like a sketch show for kids, hosted by Michael Benteen, the popular uh, comedy actor and artist. Um, and they used to have a, a section that uh, used to have things going on, uh, but you couldn't actually see anybody, and it were all like done like this, and, and, and footsteps appearing, which we'll see in this again later, and, and stuff like that. It were, it were highly amusing as a kid. I don't know what I'd think now. Anyway, anyway some things headed towards them at high speed. There it is. Uh, goes round the corner. Uh, driver must be a madman. And they say, what driver? And this is where we meet Robbie the Robot. Here he is. Here he is, Robbie the Robot. Um, I don't know who's inside him. Hang on. Does it say? Uh, the, well, there's been more than one inside. Uh, which one is it now? Uh, Frank Darrow, Robbie the Robot, says uncredited. But I think he was fired. <laughs> uh, Marvin Miller was the voice of Robbie the Robot. Um, oh, it was Les Tremaine that did um, the narrator at the beginning. Uh, we've seen him. He, he did a lot of films. He, he was in War of the Worlds, wasn't he? Uh, usually plays generals, but he was also a voice in Star Chaser, The Legend uh, of Orin. Uh, was it Frank Darrow that were fired? There were somebody that were... Um, um, inside Robbie the Robot were fired because he went for a uh, a liquid lunch and fell over <laughs> and were fired. I've got it here somewhere. I've, I've um, <coughs> highlighted it somewhere. Uh, anyway, yes, it was. Robbie the Robot was originally operated by stuntman actor Frank Darrow. He was fired during filming after almost falling over while inside the expensive prop following a five martini lunch. Uh, so they must have got somebody else in. Uh, but I don't know who. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Uh, does it say there? Da, 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 da. Just bear with me. I'm just checking. All cast and crew. Robbie the robot. Ch -ch -ch. No, it doesn't say. It doesn't say. I wonder who the who the girl in. Don't know. Best actor in film history. Les Tremaine. Uh, I think Christopher Heyerdahl and um, Jeffrey Coombs. I think we, you know, we covered that, didn't we, uh, to the day. <laughs> anyway, right, so here he is, Robbie the Robot's arrived. So here he comes waddling down. Um, I think he nearly fell down uh, when he comes down this little ramp. Um, I think there's, like, behind-the-scenes footage of him almost falling and sliding down this little ramp here. Hey! <laughs> but uh, anyway... Uh, I wonder if they ever went to lunch and just left the actor there in the suit. I bet they did. They do that a lot, don't they, in Hollywood. So, they've never seen a robot like this before. This is where we learn that uh, he's monitored to transport them to the residence. Great design. Um, you know, like, you know, like, I don't know, classed as Art Deco or whatever, I don't know. Uh, oh, Robbie. <laughs> yes, Robbie's. Being everywhere, aren't he? He's quite prolific, but even in Gremlins. Anyway, uh, not much digital technology. As I said, it's all very analog technology. There's all things clicking and whirring inside Robbie the Robot, all this stuff and things spinning and all that jazz. Uh, imagine he's like got lots of valves inside. Not not meant not many uh, circuit boards and stuff like that it's all valves and <laughs> and pipes and tubes and and all that jazz but anyway so they're introducing it to where we're learning about robbie the robot and said so somebody asks uh, i think it's cookie says is it a boy or a girl what why does he want to know maybe he's like um frost from um <laughs> from aliens but uh, says uh, in in my uh in my case, the question is without meaning. Um, all right, nice climate you have here. High oxygen content it's got. So I rarely use it myself, sir. It promotes rust. And all that jazz. Uh, so he's got a sense of humour. Um, right, so they're not using the tractor. They're going to uh, the Morbius residence um, with Robbie. So 
Uh, Farnham and Doc and the captain uh, or the commander, whatever, uh, are the away team. Um, the first officer, the doctor and the commander, captain. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Right, so off they go. Uh, oh, I to say, he says, fasten seat belts, please. So they fasten their seat belts, but obviously Bobby didn't think he were going to go, and he ain't got a seat belt, so he's got her hold on. Uh, there you go, like that. Uh, right, so they set off, and they arrive at the uh, Morbius residence, which, I don't know, for some reason, it kind of reminds me of uh, LAX. <laughs> Not that I've ever been there, but... Uh, uh, a garden of Eden in the in you know veritable garden of Eden in the the wilds of uh, Altair Four. Uh, anyway, uh, apparently the sets that they built for this um, they didn't get the budget for, <laughs> and he just built the sets. Did uh, the set designer whoever he was, um, and they were like half finished, and then the the studio sort of like uh, money man came down and. And, and noticed that the, all these sets were half built, and uh, basically, basically, it had to give them the money to finish because he hadn't. They'd sort of like half built all the sets instead of just building one full set and then moving on to another one. They sort of like half built all of them so that they'd get the money to finish them, so they could have all the sets that they wanted. That's what they did. Anyway, so here they are. We're meeting Morbius, played by Walter Pigeon. Uh, I don't know what sort of fish that is supposed to be. Is it supposed to be a real fish or is it just a... No, it didn't. It's not a seal or canth or anything, but... Uh, is it uh, an Altair 4 fish supposed to be? I have no idea. Right, so here we go. We were introduced to uh, uh, Professor Morbius and uh, or Dr Morbius, whatever the hell he is. What is he? Is he Professor or Doctor? I can never remember. Uh, doctor, it's just Dr Morbius. Uh, it's obviously not tenured, um, so it's where we we learn that um, you know it's just he it just wants to be there by himself. Um, but he's got all these people wanting to help him. But uh, he says, "Come, come in," you know. Um, ignore my uh, grumpiness. Uh, anyway, so Robbie's arranged dinner for them, uh, lunch or whatever. Uh, it was delicious. Robbie makes everything. They're amazed by him because he can do anything, can Robbie. Uh, but we learn later on that uh, Professor Morbius uh, actually built him. Uh, it looks more like the master to me. This is very... Uh, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the actor that first played him. I've forgotten. I know Anthony Ainsley did him second. Uh, I can't remember the name of the fellow that played him first. Anyway... Uh, or Mirror Universe, because he's got a beard and goatee. But anyway, a tash and goatee. Anyway, so he starts showing what Robbie can do. Um, we learn he can replicate things. He's a walking replicator. Uh, yes, Delga Delgado. Um, I can't remember his first name. <laughs> um, I keep thinking Victor, but that doesn't sound right. Anyway, Roger. It's Roger Delgado, isn't it? Just just came to me. Roger Delgado. Uh, also kind of reminds me uh, of Who's It from the Black Hole. Um, uh, kind of a little bit like this This. This. This area here is a little bit like Vincent, in it? From the Black Hole. Um, I don't want that fish singing to me. And Roger, yes, yes, Roger Delgado. Um, anyway, we learn he's a walking replicator. You just introduce something into this slot and then you can replicate it in any amount, uh, any shape or quantity. So, there we go. So, it's amazing. Uh, uh, all right. And it's also... Uh, we learn he's got a, a disposal unit and it just throws that apple or whatever it is, that fruit in. Gets vaporised and then we learn that he's... Totally um, um, obedient. Uh, it tells R Robbie to put his arm in it. Put your arm in there. And uh, so he, he was going to do it. And then he says, cancel. You know, says, and then say, you know, don't, don't worry. Robbie's just a tool. Uh, but we learn he's not just a tool. He's a character. Anyway. Um, oh, ah, yes. Uh, he, he gives uh, the commander's gun. Uh, blaster to uh, to Robbie, 
and uh, he practices with it on the the tree out there. And then he says, uh, "Aim it at the commander, shoot him right between the eyes." Uh, and he can't because he can't kill a, a, a sentient being. Uh, you know, he says fire. Then all his uh, there you go. All that starts happening. He starts blowing all his fuses or whatever he's got <laughs> in there. But he says cancel. So off he goes. So we learn that he can't harm people. Um, right. So now we're going to be introduced to Altera, who is Morbius's daughter. Robbie has a Mr. Fusion. That's also probably how he travelled back in time. <laughs> with his power and his flux capacity with his Mr. Fusion. Uh, oh, ah, yes, I forgot. I forgot. He demonstrates some more parlour magic, as he describes. With these shutters. Um, it says, had Robbie installed these shutters before he learned how, how totally safe he was there. Even though we learned there's tigers and stuff running about. But anyway. Um... Uh, 76 vacuum tubes. Yes, I imagine he's got all that stuff inside him. But uh, anyway, so he opens up the shutters again. And this, I think this is where we meet Altera now in a minute. What's happening there? Is that behind him? Has he got antenna? <laughs> um, they want to interview the rest of the Bellerophon party. And he says, ah, but they're all dead, Commander. Every last one of them. Um and he's buried them in, on Boot Hill yonder. Uh, it's going to show us in a bit. Um, there you go. They're all going to go back to Earth. And he and his wife uh, wanted to stay. But the vote was taken that they should all go back to Earth. And as the, the Bellerophon rose up to take off, it, some force vaporised the ship and killed everybody on board. But there must have been bodies, um, maybe because uh, he buried the rest of them. Up on Boot Hill, as we'll see in a bit. Uh, other people were, were torn apart by this invisible force. They got torn limb from limb. The Bellerophon was vaporised. Anyway. Um, right, this is where we meet Altera, his daughter, played by Anne Francis. Uh, for some reason, she doesn't wear shoes in this film. Apparently, there's a there is a scene where she does wear shoes, where she goes to visit the um, the ship, but uh, I don't know if we ever saw saw her feet in that that. But we might have done. I don't know. But the rest of the film, she wears nothing on the feet, so she's barefoot for some reason. I don't know why. Um, anyway, so here she is. So they're all like, "Whoa, it's a woman. We've been in space for a year. Whoa, because they can't help themselves, you know, because it's the fifties. Um, uh, this film influenced Tarantino as well. Yes, bare feet, yes. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, I wonder if the tags were supposed to be... Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'll take your word for that. I have no idea. <laughs> no, the tigers are... Well, they're from Earth, aren't they? We learned that there's animals uh, from Earth on Altair 4 uh, that were... Taken back. We learn that the Krell, the original inhabitants of uh, Altair 4, travelled to Earth years before the dawn of man and brought specimens back, like the tigers and deer and birds and stuff like that. Uh, but anyway. Uh, right, so we're introducing uh, to um, uh, the, 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 the horny spacemen. <laughs> Look at them. Can't take their eyes off her. Uh, I mean, she's not helping because she's saying, oh, them, the end ones are gorgeous and all that stuff. There you go. Oh, the end, two end ones are unbelievable because, you know, she's basically a whore. <laughs> we'll learn later. I'm sorry, but uh, she is. Uh, so he's going to get her some coffee. Um, and when I first saw this, I thought, is she real? Is she another creation of Morbius, like a robot or something like that? Because... I don't know. There's there's a conversation between between her and and Adams later that uh, that makes me wonder. Anyway, um, right. So now with his, where is um, oh he's doing a bit of double entendre stuff, uh, saying he wish he was like Robbie, but only in certain ways. I.e., Robbie hasn't got a Jimmy. But um, uh, anyway. 
uh, oh, I and um, Morbius suggested he should really allow Altera to travel to Earth at some point, you know, to further her education and all that stuff. Um, but, um, oh, there's another one here. All three of you are such very fine exceptions, she says. So obviously Morbius has been filling her head with uh, notions that people from Earth are not to be trusted and all that jazz. Um, by the way, there's rank, uh, not rank, uh, the department uh, colours out there. I noticed the commanders is red. Uh, he's got black as Jerry and um, and I think the doc's got a blue thing but I think the rest of the crew are just white uh, they're um, whatever they are uh, I think the doc's is blue anyway uh, oh and he starts bad mouthing the commander uh, saying that uh, you know he says oh I can be trusted good old reliable Jerry uh, and the doc too in the daytime but then he starts what about the, the commander and saying no oh, don't let uh, any girl or woman be alone with him. <gasps> Ooh, bloody hell, fire. But anyway. But anyway. Right, so, anyway, so they're talking about, um, you know, as you can see, we're all super duper. Oh, no, we haven't done yet. So you've got to. Uh, it says that um, you, should, you should be able to. You should be allowed to go to Earth. Um, Altair equals Miranda from the Tempest. Yes, yes, and and yeah, and Morbius is Prospero, isn't he? Not that I've, I've not read it. Wind Grace will know he's read it. <laughs> uh, dear. Uh, she says, uh, "Why should I want to go to Earth? I've got you and Robbie and all my friends." And they say, "Your friends?" And they say, "Oh, go and call them." So she basically got a dog whistle, inaudible. They all, like, oh, I uh, felt that. Oh, look. And says, oh, it's, it's calling a friend. So we see some deer arrive. Um, there they are. So she's petting them. But then a tiger comes in a minute. Here it comes. They're growling and a tiger comes. A nice little... Um, obviously, she's not in the same room as the tiger when this was filmed. And it's that split-screen effect. So you can see it just there, down there. I think the tiger... Sort of like fades away in, in bits, <laughs> um, but uh, she's not there. But it's you know it's a nice nice effect. Well, you can see there where it's put its head. Look, you can just see it's just semi transparent in the dissolve. But uh, anyway, so she's she can calm animals. That's her superpower for some reason. I don't know why, but animals are all gentle when she's around. Uh, it was as tame as a kitten, but uh, obviously. The crew deflower her and the animals turn on her <laughs> later. I'm, I'm not lying. But anyway, uh, so off that tiger goes, you know, there we go. Cool. Right, so, oh, my, the Quinn calls in, Richard Anderson, um, um, Oscar Goldman from Six Million Dollar Man. He calls into checking them on the command mic and he's, his little thing like that. Like that, isn't it? Hang on. So he's checking around. Says, uh, "Show, him, turn on the camera so I can see that you're all right." So he's saying, "You can, hang on. You can see we're not being restrained in any way." And then uh, points the camera to Altair, and then we hear a wolf whistle. Uh, oh, there we go. Hang on. Quinn whistling over radios. Oh, knock it off. Nice bit of levity, you know. Wouldn't get made today, would it? <laughs> but then we learn that, um, you know, the, the Bellerophon um, fatalities are not covered in his orders. I haven't got very good orders then, has he? You'd think it'd all be in there, wouldn't it? But never mind. So he's got to contact base for new orders. And um, uh, and doing that, they, they haven't got the equipment to contact Earth, because I think it means Earth base. Um, it means they basically got to dismantle the ship and, and, and put the drive section, use the p drive section as the power supply uh, for the transmitter that's going to send a signal to Earth uh, for new orders. But don't, don't they have that anyway? But obviously not, but without dismantling the ship. But that's what they've got to do. Um, so... 
contact her, where he's saying they've got to contact Earth Base and basically dismantle the ship to build the transmitter. And um, there you go, it says, constructing a bunker to house the car would take about 10 days. And he says, well, would two-inch lead shielding do? He says, yeah, if we had loads of it. He says, well, I'll have Robbie the robot, rub it off, uh, run it off and he'll bring it tomorrow. And then he shows him Boot Hill in a minute. Hang on. Says, look up there. There you go. Boot Hill, where they buried everybody and, and also carved some nice memorials. <laughs> or maybe got Robbie the Robot to do it. Sorry, Robbie. Robbie of the Robot. Don't forget the comma. Uh, that seems like a stupid setup for contacting home. It is. It's a bit of a faff, isn't it? <laughs> You'd think they'd have a way to contact Earth Base, no matter how far away they are. Or maybe he just needs a way to contact Earth immediately, you know, because he says, he says um, he's got to find a way to um, something like disrupt the continuum or something on a five or six parsec level. So maybe he needs to contact Base. Maybe you, the normal communications they have with Earth takes time. Um but the need to do this to get in touch with Earth immediately, you know, they need, they need a super powered transmitter. Maybe I don't know. I'm uh, I'm justifying it. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so he's been very helpful, is Morbius, because he doesn't want to dig those graves again. Anyway, so off they go back to the ship, and um, right, so fasten your seatbelt, gentlemen. So off they go, and then we have a nice establishing shot of the ship at night um, with the guards and stuff, and the moons. Um, and then uh, suddenly it's morning, and then we have more people wandering about. Uh, and then it's morning, and they're all getting ready now. They're dismantling the ship. Um, I think this maybe is the car, or it's something important, that they're using the tractor to, to pull out the way. Cool design. It's like it reminds me of. Um, uh, I've got um, a book called Project Sword, um, and that's got stuff like this in it. Um, it's like um, a Jerry Anderson thing, uh, but it's, it's it's got nothing to do with this. It's, it's a story about the Earth is being destroyed by the sun or something in the year three thousand and thirty-three, and Project Sword is trying to save the Earth, but. Um, in, in in it, it's got all machinery that they're using, and it's all that, like this. It's like stuff from a, uh, like Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet and all that stuff. It's what it reminds me of. Anyway, maybe Enterprise hasn't set up the subspace radio repeaters yet, no, it hasn't. Uh, Echo 1 and Echo 2 and all them that they dropped. <laughs> uh, anyway, so there you go, they're moving that. Uh, oh, no, she is. She's, she's come to see, she's come to watch them working. Um, in a arm, <laughs> whatever the hell it's supposed to be. Uh, oh, here's Robert with his um his lead shielding, and they said, "Hang on, that's that's um solid lead." And he said, "Oh, common lead would have crushed the whatever that's called transport or whatever." Uh, this is my mor morning's run of isotope. I can't remember. Let's have a look. See what he says. Da -da 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 -da. Da, da, da. Crush the vehicle. There we go. Isotope 217. The whole thing hardly comes to 10 tons. Anyway, so there you go. So a bit of levity. Anyway, Farnham's going chatting up Altera. Um, and the commander notices. Um, see, she's been naughty. She's not, she's not supposed to be there. But uh, the commander notices. We see him look over in a minute. Uh, but they're going to do a bit of fun and games first with Cookie because he's got his metal pans and stuff in his, tucked in his in in his pants. So they're going to use the uh, the big magnet on the tractor to. Uh, there we go. <laughs> fun and games. Anyway, so they drive off with him, and then he looks round and sees what Farnham's doing. He's taking. Um, I'll tear her off into the woods or whatever it is, <laughs> uh, into the countryside. Anyway, so he's distracted now. But uh, Oscar Goldman comes and says um, he's got his stuff ready for the Klystron transmitter. I don't know what a Klystron is, but uh, anyway, here we go. It's more equipment that we've seen, by the way, in other things. Um, 
but uh, uh, that that thing there, you know, that that thing there, we've seen in other in other shows. I suspect. Uh, I know it's true later, but maybe maybe a lot of stuff for this were made. Um, but but there's, there's companies in it that you can hire, sort of like technical looking things for science fiction films, and um, I think this became one of them, which is why you see it a lot in other in other shows. Here we go. Um, a klystron is a vacuum tube that converts the energy energy of a pulse high voltage generated by a pulse modulator into a high power microwave. Well, I could have told you that, but uh, anyway, I didn't want to get all technical. <laughs> uh, it's all fun and games until someone eats someone else. Yes, it is. Right, so, um, right, so he's, he's getting ready with all his equipment, and then he's got to put it all back inside now. He says, get it, get it in by dark. Unless some idiot, because some idiot will fall over it. But anyway. Uh, meanwhile, Cookie is uh, having a chat with Robbie, the robot. Uh, there he is, and the, I don't know. Somebody must, you know, word must have got out that Robbie can, can recreate things. He's a walking replicator, um, not replicator like Stargate replicator, a Star Trek replicator. Uh, so word must have got out. So he wants Robbie to um, there we go to um, replicate in some booze, some bourbon. Some ancient rocket bourbon. Um, so there he goes. So he has a little... Uh, Analyses it and burps. Because it's funny. Uh, and then he says, The immortal line, Would 60 gallons be sufficient? Uh, by the way, he says, it, he says what it is. Um, um, alcohol molecules with traces of fusel oil. And apparently fusel oil is, is the stuff in booze. I don't know if it's... This is what I've read on, on the internet. Um, is the stuff that, um, um, whatchamacallit, um, makes hangovers worse than, than, you know, the more fusel oil is in, is in the drink or whatever, the worse your hangover will be. I don't know if that's true or not, I don't know. So he replicates it without the fusel oil so he doesn't get a hangover. Anyway, there you go, would 60 gallons be sufficient? But can a Star Trek replicator replicate a Stargate replicator that could then and then could that replicate a replicator replicator? Yes. Say that three times. <laughs> How many cans can a cannibal nibble if a cannibal can nibble cans? Eh, dear. Anyway, would sixty gallons be sufficient? So it's gonna get sixty gallons of um of booze soon. Meanwhile, uh Farnham is kissing and cuddling, but not really cuddling with um, Altera. Well, they the shorten it to Alta for some reason. Princess has just started. What are you doing? She'll start meowing in a minute. Uh, for some reason, they shorten it to Alta. Uh, sometimes it's Alta, sometimes it's Altera. I don't know. Uh, anyway, it's trying to kiss her. It's saying, you know, just give me a little kiss and um, it's good for you. It stimulates you, the whole system. Uh, obviously, she's never kissed anybody. Um, yes, she's forbidden fruit. Yes, she is. She's the apple. <laughs> oh dear. Maybe that's what those um, antenna were <laughs> that we saw earlier on on Morbius. You know, from that Star Trek episode, the apple. That fella had an antenna thing, didn't he? That wire's coming out of his head. Him that were crying. Anyway, um, so he kisses her. And they say, oh, is that all there is to it? And then they says, oh, well, you know, kisses her a second time. Um, so, and then she, she says, oh, just once more, do you mind? Um, so there you go. So he kisses her again. Um, there you go. But then the commander arrives. There he is. And uh, he um, uh, berates Farnham for taking advantage of Altera and dismisses him and then she's saying why, why are you talking like why did you look at each other so funny um I said we were just trying to get some healthy stimulation from hugging and kissing that's all and he's like that's all um but anyway behave look she's starting she is she's sta every time every bloody time you want to go out right i'll just let the cat out bear with me Oh, 
follow me now, Nemo. Anyway, I forgot where I was now. Oh, I says the clothes and all that. Go, go around in front of these men dressed like that because she's showing off her legs and all that. Uh, by the way, this film was banned in Spain uh, under the, the rule of... Um, um, I forgot the fellow that were in charge <laughs> in Spain. Um, oh, what do they call him now? <sighs> anyway, him. Um... Because, uh, you know, her, her clothes were too sexy, apparently. Um, hang on, let's have a look. Hang on. I've got it here in the... I've got it highlighted somewhere. There we go. The mini dress worn by Anne Francis was seen to be the first worn in a Hollywood movie. Yes, she's wearing mini skirts and stuff before mini skirts became popular. And resulted in the film... Uh, being banned in Spain, it was not shown there until 1967 due to General Franco's, that's it, Franco, Franco's dictatorship that considered it dirty and obscene that a woman wore a mini dress to show off legs. So there we go. Bloody, bloody Franco. Uh, just done that one. Uh, just Temple says, I'm a moonshiner and the oils do cause a bit, but dehydration is the main culprit. That's why I drink Gatorade after drinking. There you go. Good advice from Josh Temple there. <laughs> does everything. It's just, he makes his own booze. He goes harpooning and hunting. and everything. It's Completely self-sufficient. When we're all dead in the upcoming you know, nuclear holocaust that's just round the corner, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Thank goodness. Anyway. Right, where were we? Uh, oh, ah, yes, she's berating her clothes. And uh, she says, I designed them myself. She doesn't. She doesn't design her dresses herself. She just goes up to Robbie and says, Robbie, make me a dress and put jewels in it. Because we see her do that later. She, don't, she, does, she does nothing. Anyway. So they have a row and um, he, um, I think he shouts at her a bit. Um, I think he's saying, you know, he's in charge. Uh, oh, this is the bit, uh, by the way, that I was thinking, when I first saw it, is she human? Is she a robot or something? Because he says to her, there's no feelings, no emotions. Obviously, where Gene Roddenberry got the idea for Spock, probably. Uh, although he did have emotions in the cage, didn't he? He has emotions. Well, he has emotions because Vulcans do have emotions, but he was always showing them with Spock. He was always doing it. Even though he said he didn't have any, but he was always showing them. Anyway, hopefully, hang on, I can also eat raw meat. Oh, I can also eat meat raw, so yes, I'll be there with the cockroaches. <laughs> You'll be the ruler, Josh Temple, you know. He will build a temple, because he'll be a god among us all mutated forms. <laughs> as mutated freaks, we'll all be looking upon Josh as the new god and our king. Anyway. Hopefully the aliens get here first. The green fireball was seen here a couple of days ago. And then a bunch of military aircraft flew over. I'm crossing my fingers. Cool. But you do live in that area, don't you? I think roughly. Um, like the New York area. You know, New York State. Um, what do they call it? The Hudson Valley UFO flap, wasn't there? That's, that's roughly our area, isn't it? Maybe that's it. It might have been UFOs. Anyway, where will we? Uh, I forgot what I say now. All right, so he shouts at her now. He's in command of 18 competitively selected... Well, what does he say? Oh, for God's sake. Um, super perfect physical specimens with an average age of 24.6 who've been cooped up in space... What is it? In hyperspace... Uh, for 378 days. And he's shouting and bawling at her and says, who knows what would have happened if I hadn't come and he'd have, you know done stuff, and um, then he says, oh, get out of here, I'll have you run under, run out under guard, and then I'll put more guards on the guard, so she runs off, and then she's telling her dad what happened, and she says, I, I hate him, I hate him, but we know they're going to fall in love, um, and she says, oh, but don't see him until I'm 400 million, and, um, oh, are you? I was only being nice about kissing the lieutenant, and then he goes, oh, <laughs> raises his eyebrow, like that. <laughs> and then the commander was furious, obviously. But anyway, she's off to bed. She says, you should go to bed. I've got some work to do in my office. So she goes now and she's calling for Robbie. 
the robot. Rob is the slave of the house, by the way. Droid rights and all that. Uh, there you go. She's, she's using that beam. Uh, she, she does it once. Beam. And then she does it again immediately. Because she doesn't appear immediately. And then, look. She does it three times. She goes beep. 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 Literally that quickly. And she's cross. Because it didn't, it didn't appear out of thin air. Anyway, here he comes trudging in. Uh, obviously the inspiration for Marvin the Paranoid Android, but uh, <laughs> he should come in saying, Life, don't talk to me about life. Um, if I was in the back trying to kill myself. Uh, well, Robbie is made of darker materials. <laughs> um, I think the fellow that played the cook, I can't remember his name, um, Cook, 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 cook. Uh, Earl Holliman. Oh, we've seen in loads of stuff. Um, I think he said uh, the body of Robbie the Robot actually made of wood and it used to creak and make noises as the, you know, the fella inside moved it about. But anyway. Uh, that's, that's by the by. Anyway, he comes in and she says, Robbie, I beamed and beamed. So I just didn't give him any chance to get there. Oh, I don't like it. <laughs> I wouldn't have been kissing her, but uh, anyway. Uh, I beamed and beamed. He said, sorry, miss, I was giving myself an oil job. But, uh, uh, probably much like uh, 3PO got an oil job in um, in, in Star Wars, didn't he? But, uh, anyway, she wants him to make a dress for her. Um, and he says, radiation proof. And, no, just high proof will do. And she says he wants it all to cover everything. And um, she wants lots of star sapphires. And he says, star sapphires take a week to crystallise. Will diamonds or emeralds do? And she goes, well, if they're big enough. And he says, yes, whatever. Um, so she's all happy now because she's making a dress that will please the commander because she obviously really loves him. <sighs> anyway, right, meanwhile, uh, back at the ship, uh, see two guards here. We see here the, the, the area of burnt ground. It says in the trivia thing that they, they used um, um, burnt sawdust as the, to replicate the shadow under the ship in the moonlight. But it's not. It's just the it's the burnt area left by, well, I think it is, left by the, the landing beam. which is, That's what I'm going to call it, the landing beam. Anyway, two guards here, and uh, one of them says, do you, do you hear that? And they can hear some breathing, because we can hear a noise, like a, an electronic noise of, like, footsteps going boink, boink. We're also going to hear this little low breathing as well. Um, but um, There we go. Hear big breathing. Obviously, something big is going past them, and it uh, goes up the stairs into the ship, and uh, we see a chap there asleep. Uh, in his bunk, uh, well, it's the others asleep, but he wakes up uh, just as he sees this this hatch opens up. Uh, there it is, that hatch opens up, uh, and then that moves, and then then we learn uh, here we go, next day that something was destroyed in the lab, the cyclon, cy clystron, whatever the thingy, my bob, uh, were damaged. Um, but, uh, so he's, he's doing discipline on the two guards and the fellow that were asleep. And, um, you know, they obviously reported that um, they heard breathing and um, and he uh, had a dream. So he had a dream that he thought he saw something. So he, he docks their pay and he makes him stand ex 20 extra watches. I'll have less dreaming about this ship, he says. Because he's, uh, he's a tyrant. Uh, oh, he ain't got blue, he's got red as well, I've just noticed. It's oh, actually got some sort of pattern on, hasn't it, I think. I don't know. Anyway. Um, so he disciplines them. There we go. Me too, sir, will stand 20 extra watches. I'll have less dreaming about this ship. Dismissed. Because he's, you know, a tyrant. Uh, but anyway. Um, um, Quinn says, you know, this this is damaged, this uh, whatever it is. Um uh, there we go. Klystron frequency modulator. Sounds like something um, Marvin the Martian would say, wouldn't it? In the the, the uh, Looney Tunes cartoons. 
Special Klystron Frequency Modulator. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's pretty badly damaged, and he says, he says, using the whole resources of the ship, I might be able to fix it. But you know, by but by, the book says no. It says okay, so it's impossible. Um, how long will it take? And he says, well, if I don't stop for breakfast, so they all have a laugh and go, ha ha ha. Right. Anyway, right. So uh, they're going in the tractor back to the Morbius residence, and um, Jerry Farnham comes up and says, I'll change my clothes to come with you, even though he seems to be wearing the same clothes that they are. But never mind. Um, but we learn that uh, the commander's leaving him in charge there at the ship uh, because, uh, you know, obviously he wants Altera now, doesn't he? He don't want him to have her. So a bit of, um, you know, a, a love triangle growing on, uh, going on, but not really. But uh, there we go. Set up a, a, a perimeter. So, right, so they've got to set up stuff. Anyway, Robbie's doing his housework. As I said, he's a slave doing flowers and stuff. And then this little monkey arrives uh, and starts taking some fruit and Robbie just shoots it with his, but not shoots it dead. Uh, uses his, his some sort of repulsor beam. Uh, here we go. Uh, obviously that monkey's on a string and just yanked it off the table. It was the 50s. You could do cruel things to animals. I'm sure it's fine. It goes running off, look. Because uh, you can't have monkeys stealing the family fruit, can you? Anyway, so they've arrived to see Dr. Morbius. Um, I think we learn he's in his office, not to be disturbed when that door's shut. There we go. Uh, the only door to his office. Um, so he tells the doctor, wait there, call him if Morbius comes out. He's going to go check on them. Um, much of much of a call it. I'll tear her. That archway thing looks just like the Strange New World set. They, they see it. It does. I wonder if these got reused in Star Trek. They're very Star Trek. Are these angled support things? Aren't they? Um, there's Chapel slept in one once. Yes, she did, didn't she? There's that photo. That made that photo, isn't there? See if I can find it. Hang on. <laughs> hey. See if we can find it. Oh, I've got a tickling nose. I'm going to have an argument. Oh, I'm going to have an argument with. Now then, let's see if we can find it. There we go. There we go. I will, uh, I will open that in a new tab. And I'll pop that over here for you to see. You ready? Here we go. No. What are you doing? What's that? What's that? Stop it. Supposed to open, not open link, open image. There we go. That one, isn't it? Where are we? There we go. That that image, isn't it? Can you see it? Yes. There it is. Look. But I think I've seen it in original series as well, by the way. But yes, is uh, the lovely Jess Bush. Oh, I drew yesterday, didn't I? Anyway. Um, right. <laughs> there we go. Uh, but yes, I've, I've seen these in... Um, I'm sure I've seen them in, in original series Star Trek. I bet they did reuse some of the uh, sets and stuff like that. I know it's a different studio, but I bet they hired them or bought them off or whatever. Or they all went into storage and got rented out or whatever to other studios. I bet they did make a bit of extra money. Anyway, the commander's going to go and check out Altair. Um, so off he goes. Um, oh, wow, the, the wondering did... Could Robbie have slipped past the sentries to destroy that equipment? I think, nah, not really. Anyway, so it goes out. We find she's she's swimming and she's kind of making out that she's got no clothes on, but we can clearly see that she has. She says, why don't you come in for a swim? And she says, I forgot my bathing suit. And she goes, what's a bathing suit? And you obviously see she's got a bathing suit on, but anyway, maybe she just calls it something else. Uh, Wingress, they reuse Planet of the Apes stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So here she goes. Uh, she says, what's a bathing suit? And um, But she gets out here. And you can see, clearly see she's got something on. Look, hang on. Oh, hang on. You know, just to, just to 
put the mock there you go. she clearly had something on bloody teasing us but anyway she puts a new dress on that she's just designed she just said robbie robbie make me a dress anyway here she comes in a new dress and this is where we look the falling in love the being nice to each other there we go and um he says, don't you like it? I had it made especially for you. And he says, I thought you would not expecting me and all that jazz. He says, maybe it's just me you don't like. And he says, you always look beautiful. And then, and then we learn that she's a whore. <laughs> uh, there you go. Why don't you kiss me like everybody else does? So she's obviously, you know, she's been through the crew like a dose of salts. <laughs> everybody. Uh, so I, I hope Robbie the Robot's got some form of, you know, medical um, expertise as well <laughs> and given us something for it. But uh, anyway, oh, uh, we learned that she's um, she's learned, what she learned? Um, she's done poetry, mathematics, logic, physics, geology and biology, she says. There you go. Uh and he says, yes, that's mostly on the theoretical side. And she says, well, what's wrong with theory? And he goes, this, and grabs her and shoves his tongue down her throat and all that stuff. There you go. Because ah, they're in love now. They're in love. And Farnham can go and take a hike. Because he's in command and he can do what he wants. Meanwhile, the tiger arrives. Uh, and obviously because she's been, as I said earlier, she's been deflowered by the entire crew of the C-57D. Um, the tiger can sense this, and um, it's much like um, in Live and Let Die, isn't it? You know, with um, uh, Jane Seymour, Solitaire. Once James Bond had his wicked way with her, she lost her psychic powers, didn't she? Same sort of thing. All oh, right, he's my friend. And then the tiger just leaps at her. Here we go. Uh, in a, a cool special effects scene, it was a bit nice animation. Uh, here it goes. Whoop, Vaporised it with his blaster. It's a phaser, whatever. <laughs> but he's vaporised it. So cool. And then she's like, "It didn't recognise me." And uh, she's saying, "Now I had to do that because it was going to, you know, tear our throats out, wouldn't it?" Yes, Peter wouldn't be happy, would they? <laughs> or Peter, whatever. How do they bloody pronounce it? Anyway, and she doesn't understand, and, well, just tell her, you're a whore, suddenly. But anyway, right, so it leaves her to cry over this tiger. And uh, he goes, and uh, he's learned that the doctor hasn't come out, of Dr. Morbius hasn't come out. And then he tells the Doc Ostro, something has been added, you know, he's fallen in love. Whatever. Right, anyway, they go up to the door and it just opens. They could have gone in any time, but uh, they go in uh, into his office. Uh, that design again. Uh, he's got a, a, a globe with constellations on. That won't be much good, will it? You know, if, I presume that's Earth constellations. They're on Altair 4. Maybe it's sentimental. I don't know. Uh, and a blackboard and, sorry, a chalkboard. So you can't call them that now, can you? Uh, and all that stuff. The robot lied. The, the, the Morbius has never been, was never in here. Because apparently there's only one door. Uh, we learned there isn't only one door. Uh, there we go. Hieroglyphics, maybe. I don't know. It looks, looks like some form of electrical thing, doesn't it? Well, from that, I don't know. Uh, but as they're looking at this, this door, this massive door opens, and there uh, Dr. Morbius arrives and he says, The Household silver is in the dining room and my daughter's jewellery is on her dressing table. Because he's accusing them of being thieves and they're just looking at something, but anyway. Right, so... Anyway, so it says, right, um, somebody broke into the ship last night and damaged expensive equipment or whatever, or delicate equipment or important equipment, whatever. Uh, so he says, the, the time has come for clarification. I thought, all right, he's going to provide an alibi. But no, he just goes into a, a history lesson <laughs> about the Krell. But never mind. 
Uh, people eating tasty animals, they might be sad for them. Lost meat, I'm sure they'd understand. Is that what Peter stands for? <laughs> people eating tasty animals. If God didn't, you know, if God made us... If, if we weren't supposed to eat animals, why did God make them out of meat? That's what I'm trying to say. But anyway. <laughs> anyway. Right, so it goes into this history about the crow. It says, years ago, 2,000 centuries ago. Why did it just say 200,000 years? I don't know, but anyway. Um, this planet was the home of a people called the Krell. There we go. A mighty, a noble race of beings called the Krell, who were super benevolent and, uh, you know, were amazing, you know, the like the progenitors or whatever from Star Trek, and they turned their, once they solved all the problems on on the, on their own world went out into space and did amazing things but stole kidnapped animals from earth brought them back here for some reason don't know why but they did um but um they disappeared just as they're about to do the most amazing thing they have ever done in their history they they just disappeared overnight apparently um their crowning achievement and um you know they don't know what it was and even their their cities and stuff of glass and adamantine steel have crumbled back into the soil of altair 4 and nothing remains above the surface but there is stuff below the surface and this is where we learn no record of their physical they don't have photos or anything obviously not Pardon me why why is there no physical record of what the krell look like don't know, but he suggests that um, maybe this arch is a just a krell door, and so uh, you know, think of it as a, a, a functionally functionally designed human doorway, you know, which is basically our shape, you know what I mean, for us to fit through. So the krell, uh, obviously, you know, like me, fat. <laughs> Uh, like a menagerie, yes, like just like a menagerie. Uh, Tim Rose is here, welcome. This movie is classic. Yes, it is. It's amazing. Um, there you go. Think of it as one of our functionally designed human doorways. And then, as we see later on, the mon the id monster is kind of that shape-ish, as we'll see later. Oh, and then he plays some Krell music, which is bloody horrible. <laughs> it's you know, electronic tonalities, just boo, boo. That's basically it. Um, they were tripods. Oh my! Um, no, the bipeds. Uh, well, we don't know actually because the the id monster we see later um, is probably not what the krell looked like. It's 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 from oh spoil, spoilers for later. We'll get there, won't we? Anyway, so it's playing that. Uh, and then, it, oh, from half a million years ago, Krell musicians made that terrible music. It's just noise. <laughs> ah, no, it's only rock and roll, but I like it. Anyway, uh, so they go through this door, and then they're coming to it, they're taking him to it. Oh, and before that, this door is made of Krell steel. It says, try your blaster there, Commander. So he uh, shoots his blaster. Uh, at the door, like that. Um, and then when he goes to check it, he's in checking this area, he's looking down here for some reason. But anyway, there you go, he goes to check it and then looks at the wrong spot on the door. Look, <laughs> <laughs> this spot should be molten, it's not even warm because Krell steel is amazing. Anyway, so he goes and opens the, the door with this uh, um, combination lock. Uh, and Stargate copied that in Scorched Earth. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, where were we? Uh, yes, he opens this with combination lock. So obviously Krell had digits or whatever, so they could manipulate that um, combination lock. So we know we know they had probably opposable thumbs. Uh, oh, the alien music from a long dead race that sounded horrible. Oh, right, I can't remember. Is that Scorched Earth, that one with that, that automatic thing that's just destroying 
this 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 area and they've got to get the people you know off you know is it that one i don't know i'm terrible i'm terrible at remembering stuff anyway so we're going to a lab here we go meet this is introducing the krell lab that's the one yes it's terraforming a planet yes it is um but destroying everything as it goes uh right so they're in the lab here we go so um designed for non-human technicians i wouldn't know you can't really tell because obviously there's things that he can use like there's things with knobs and there's dials and stuff it's all very, as i said it's all very analog uh the, you know the gauges and, and knobs and levers and stuff to pull so but anyway um and he also says something he wished he'd be blessed with multiple arms and legs uh, but yet the the id monster we see later only has two legs. So but did the Krell have six arms or whatever? I don't know. But, or maybe, as Wingray says, maybe they had three. Maybe maybe they were like the the aliens in War of the Worlds, which uh, Joshua Kanapke watched earlier on. Um, anyway, um, right. So this is uh, um, like a display thing where he says, you know, you can see the entire scientific knowledge of the Krell from its primitive beginnings to the day of its annihilation and it, that's what he's been studying for 20 years and he's, um, uh, he started learning, he learned their languages and stuff because that's his profession, he's a philologist so he learned then he studied their languages and then finally could read and then started learning the Krell technology and that's how he built Robbie the Robot because it's you know, Krell technology essentially, um, and then the the captain, uh, sorry, the commander, is like saying, um, "This is amazing! Imagine what could this could be like for humanity and all that." And then the doc looks at him and then interrupts him and says, "What's this over here?" Because he does, he obviously realizes uh, the enormity of this, but it's under the control of Morbius, isn't it? Right now. So, interrupts him, and they go over here and have a look at this. This is the plastic educator. Uh, there we go. We should be blessed with multiple arms and legs. But anyway, so it dis shows this, and you can see that this was designed for something much bigger than his human cranium, with a capital C for some reason. <laughs> um, right, so he puts it on, and he makes that go about halfway up, apparently. Uh, and we learn that a, a Krell child of about seven, equivalent to about a seven-year-old human child was supposed to make it go all the way up to the top, says, which makes me a low-grade moron. Uh, anyway, and then he uses it to make a, an image appear. And they're like amazed at this uh, in a minute when he does it. There we go. The primary function is to basically create images. Uh, holograms, I suppose you could say. Uh, there we go, as it appears, there it is, of Altera. A statue, he says, does one of them, I think it's Ostro says that. <laughs> Obviously, they don't know about holograms in this timeline. Uh, he says, but it's alive! A three-dimensional image, Commander. So, I don't, when were holograms invented? When, when, when were they first, um, um, you know, um, suggested, uh, should I say? I don't know, but anyway. Um, and this is this is a clue to what's going to happen later. Um, um, they said, but she's alive and moving about. And he says, because in my mind, my daughter uh, is alive in my mind from microsecond to microsecond, and that gets repeated later on. So it's a setup for what happens later with the id monster. S spoilers. Uh, Isaac Asimov started mentioning them in the 50s. Oh, that's, this is like the 56 this film came out, isn't it? So, uh, anyway, maybe the writers didn't read Asimov. <laughs> um, right, so, uh, all right, it gives the dock a go. Uh, the dock um, doesn't make it go very far. And he says, I've got an IQ of 161. And it hasn't gone up half as a third as far as you. It says, well, well, whatever. Then it's the captain's turn, uh, whatever. Uh, commanders. I keep calling him captain, but he's Commander Adams, isn't he? Um, 
he hardly makes it go anywhere and he says, oh, never mind, a commanding officer, you know, doesn't need brains, just a good loud voice. Then he says, how do I make an image? And he says, do I pull this lever? And then um, Morbius takes off the thing and says, don't do it, the captain of the Belef... Be Be Belef... <laughs> Belef... How the bloody hell do you say it? Bellerophon. Bellerophon tried it. And it was immediately fatal. So they said, oh, so you're immune to this as well, are you? Um, but then he says, his, his first attempt at doing it, he laid unconscious for a day and a night. But then he, imagine his joy when he learned that his uh, using it had um, permanently doubled his intellectual capacity. He says, otherwise my, my uh, studies here would have come to nothing. Um, so anyway... Uh, this is where he's telling them that uh, the, the crowning achievement of the Krell civilization um, was that we're going to try and um, uh, create um, a civilization without instrumentalities. Uh, there you go. Uh, from any dependence on physical instrumentalities. So basically, anything the Krell thought of would appear. Um, and this machine was going to, you know, do that for them, you know, going to tap into their energies or whatever and create whatever they wanted, um, uh, which would be, you know, terrifying. <laughs> <coughs> but anyway. Um, but uh, obviously something went wrong and they all died. Um, but um, then the commander says, that's all well and good, but this everything here looks brand new and... Um, Morbius says, well, it's all self-cleaning and self-maintaining and all that. It's been like this for 2,000 centuries. I still don't know why I don't say 200,000 years, but anyway. Uh, but then he notes the, uh, the, uh, the, the gauges here on the wall and the decimals. So it's 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, in power, you know, going up all around the, the room, I presume. It doesn't show us, but, uh, but then we learn that when he turns this on, it turns that knob, so they must have, uh, you know, digits to turn knobs and stuff. It it registers. Uh, hang on, there, oh, there we go. It registers there, in the bottom left hand. And then when it turns on the plastic educator, it uh, it goes up a bit more. There we go. There you go. Um, but it says it can't find any wiring. Uh, there's no direct wiring whatsoever. Um, so, you know, he doesn't know how it works. It just works. And he says, sometimes um, uh, when the birds fly over in spring or whatever, it'll register, uh, or the deer, the book deer or whatever, root or whatever, I don't know what he says. Uh, it'll register on, on, on the gauges somehow. I don't know. So it's obviously tapped into the planet, isn't it, or the nature. It's tapped into everything, is this big machine. Obviously, when we get to the to see the, the machine proper, um, you'll get, you'll realise, you know, J. Michael Straczynski ripped it off for the, the machine on, the great machine on Epsilon 3 in Babylon 5, but anyway. Anyway, they're off in the shuttle car. Right, here we go. So, they're off in the shuttle car. It says, how often Krell technicians have ridden in this little vehicle? Well, I don't know. If they're all a weird, clunky triangle shape... I don't know, would they fit in? I don't know. Well, has he put these chairs in that they're sitting on there? I don't know, but anyway. Right, so they're going. Right, here we go. The great machine, obviously, uh, inspired the design of... Um, um, actually, Harlan Ellison came up with the machine. So Harlan Ellison ripped off Forbidden Planet then, not JMS. Whoever, well, whoever wrote it in Babylon 5 ripped off this from Forbidden Planet, didn't he? So, Harlan Ellison can't talk, can he, when he's accusing um, um, James Cameron of ripping him off of the Terminator. God, I hated Harlan Ellison. Anyway, so here we go. So here they arrive. They even do this scene, don't they, in, uh, in Babylon 5 with them walking across this bridge. Anyway, some nice animations again with the sparks and lights and stuff. And, uh, right, so here he comes now, says, 20 miles, and he goes, 20 miles. And I thought, hang on, I thought it was supposed to be 20 miles, you know, cubed, not 40 miles. Or is, are they on a corner? <laughs> it must be on one of the corners. 
You should have said 10 miles and 10 miles if they're in the middle. You know, but anyway, whatever. Um, uh, and then it said, I think it said uh, 7,800 levels. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Depends, I suppose it depends how tall a level is. I, I worked it out. If, if you say each level were 10 feet tall, 7,800 levels would be about 15 miles. So maybe... Maybe call it 12 feet tall then. Each level to get 20 miles. Because it's a cube, apparently. But, uh, why oh, says here, look down here, Commander. Are you scared? I said, uh, yes, I am. <laughs> if it's bloody miles down. But anyway. So, off they go. Checking other things. Here we are. It's more uh, map paintings and stuff. Um... And it's self-maintaining, and it uh, does upgrades as well to itself. I don't know if there's like a computer in charge. Don't know, but it's like self. There must there must be some sort of artificial intelligence running it, but we don't ever learn that. There we go. Pardon me. Tuning, lubricating itself, replacing worn parts, and all that jazz. There must be some central computer car or something anyway so it's going to show them the the power source uh, some form of you know fusion power i suppose but they've got to look in the mirror they can't look in that they've got to look in the mirror because one does not look upon the face of the gorgon and live so there we go uh, oh they say the, the harness power of an exploding planetary system just ask rodney mckay about that <laughs> uh, and sam and Sam. Right, so back at the ship, they've set up the perimeter with the you know an energy force field fence or whatever the bloody hell they call it. So he tests it out with a bit of uh, tumbleweed or whatever. Uh, there we go. Cool. But then we get his first look at the uh, id monster in a bit. Um, but. Um, Oh, right. Cookie wants to go outside the 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 uh, the perimeter to get some wild radishes. He says, "I don't know what you're up to, Cookie, but if the captain, or the commander finds out, we'll be in trouble." But you know, go on, off you go. So off he goes, and he's going to get his. Uh, they go trips up, and he's uh, got his sixty gallons of booze. Uh, all in bottles, it's replicated the bottles and the labels and everything, ancient rocket bourbon or whatever it says on. I think it does say that on actually, doesn't it? I think it does say ancient rocket. Is that a brand? I've no idea. Um, there they are. So he's stacked them all up. And he drinks five pints of it, apparently. Um, oh, and then Robbie, he, he notices something. We hear a noise. We hear the boom, 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 boom. Something's approaching. And um, he says, is something headed this way? And he goes, no, sir, nothing headed this way. Why don't you say, but it is heading towards the ship. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, offer that information. Uh, all right, so we get his first look at the id monsters. This guard goes by and uh, here it is, there it is. Get his first look as it comes through the energy field. There we go, see its face there, look. Yeah, oh, what happened there? He says. Uh, then, what happened there? Don't know. The field shorted out, but then there's a scream from the ship. Um, oh, no, not yet. We haven't got there yet. <laughs> uh, we see the footprints, the Michael Benteen's potty time footprints. There you go. Nobody's noticing them, are they, right now? But anyway, uh, off it goes. And it goes up the stairs, bending the stairs as it goes. And then we hear a scream. Man's, man's so reaming. They went a bit wrong there with the subtitles, didn't they? Never mind. Um, so we, Quinn's being killed. Yes, red shirt alert. <laughs> Quinn is the red shirt, isn't he? Anyway, um, um, the commander's saying, you know, this is too important, you know, for one man to be in charge of. And he's saying, no, I'm in charge here and, you know, I will, 
release to Earth any technologies that I deem humanity is ready for and all that jazz. Uh, oh, any on. Uh, but then they get interrupted. Oh, meanwhile, Altair's standing there barefoot again. Um, and he says, you know, he'll be answerable to his own conscience. But then he gets interrupted. Um, we learn He learns that uh, Quinn's being killed. He's splattered all over the lab or whatever he says. So they've got to head back. And then he goes, it's started again. Um, so obviously... I don't know how, but it's, 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 it, oh, oh, never mind, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there, right. So, meanwhile, Doc, next day, Doc's been out and got a plaster cast of those footprints. There we are. Something with a big hook or a big toenail or whatever. And he's saying it's it shouldn't exist. It's got... Um, um, it, it's got the foot of a, a quadruped, but yet it's left the tracks of a biped, and this is some arboreal creature like a giant tree sloth or ground sloth or whatever, I don't know. Um, they can't explain it. It doesn't fit into normal nature in the galaxy. It's a night. It's a nightmare. Clue. Clue. Although, this is what I'm thinking, right? Spoilers! <laughs> The the id monster is from Morbius's um, um, subconscious, um, and when it later on it attacks the ship, it's when Nor Morbius is asleep and having a nightmare. But obviously, he wasn't asleep just then, was he? Uh, when he were talking, because he was showing them round the lab and talking to a monty in his in his lab and in his office, so he wasn't asleep then. So, was it just just in the back of his mind? Still sending the monster out, the the machine, you know, was recreating this monster to go out and kill Quinn. Obviously, so. Obviously, so. Anyway, so uh, oh, this is uh, Cookie. He's up for um, discipline. Uh, he got drunk, and um, but he was with Robbie the whole time, and uh, so that that clears Rob. Robbie didn't kill Quinn, so. He is Robbie's alibi, and he doesn't get any punishment. Uh, so where we learn he had five pints of it without a hangover. So, anyway. Right, so they're going to bury Quinn. Uh, a little funeral. And um, Morbius has arrived. And um, he says, you know, the next attack will be more g deadly and general. Maybe he's also dreaming that he's awake. The dreamer must awake. <laughs> Sorry, that's the tomorrow people thing. <laughs> uh, dear. Anyway, there we go. More deadly and general. So is that a threat? Um, call it a premonition, he says. Um, apparently, by the way, um, uh, Walter Pigeon and Leslie Nielsen got on like a house on fire because uh, they're both Canadians and apparently Canadians must flock together. I don't know. And they played checkers between takes. Anyway. Um, what's, what they're going to do now? Oh, he's going to get the tractor out to prepare the tractor. He's going to, him and the dock are going to uh, uh, head back to the, the lab and get the brains boosted. Um Oh, hang on, is it? is it? I can't bloody remember. Oh my, yes, I think now because um, Quinn is dead, um, he was the, the, the technician, wasn't he? Um, essentially, they can't contact Earth now, so I think they're going to basically re gonna reassemble the ship um, and, um, and, 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 and get the, the guns out, so to speak, get the, the blasters. Because early on they mentioned blaster men, so the ship must have like guns or something that, that come out, um, you know, so they can have a space battle. But, uh, but they, get, they get those ready. Um, so they're, they're putting the, the core back, in, back into the ship. Um, so there we go, they've got the, all the blasters out and they're all ready to uh, take out what's... Uh, there we go, they're the test firing look. Pew, 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 pew. Cool. Um, so they're getting ready. Um, 
But then um, here we go. We learned that something's heading that way, heading their way. It's coming down, heading by the Arroyo. Uh, so the the fire on it. It says uh, guns to automatic, automatic tracking, and then it says fire. So the firing at it, and they're hitting it because we can hear it. Hang on. There we go. Uh, but we can't see it. Uh, but it's obviously some distance away. But they're hitting it because we can hear it going. Rrr, rrr. Uh, but it's getting close, and it says it's still coming. So anyway, but uh, then it 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 comes starts coming through the fence, as we're going to see in a minute. Uh, here it comes any minute now. Oh, hang on, too far. Here it is. It's coming through the fence, and this is where the um, yeah, the blasted thing's invisible, so it's not shooting at it. And this is where it's doing its uh, Leo the Lion <laughs> from the MGM intro. So it's going, rawr, rawr. Apparently, I don't know if that, that's actually what happened. Uh, but anyway, we get his first decent look at what it's like. But obviously, this is Morbius's subconscious thoughts of what the Krell looked like. Uh, did they look like this? Don't know. Probably not. As I said, there's no no record of their physical appearance, so he's just guessing at what they look like. But it's obviously it's got two legs and it's got a mouth and two eyes, but whatever. Um, but it's just a monster he's created in it out of his uh, his subconscious, and um, so the the shooting away at it, and it's killing people. Look, ah, it's getting ah, and all that jazz. Great monster, great monster. Uh, oh, Jerry, Jerry's going for it. Find him. This is where he dies. By the way, they had a rapprochement. Did um, find him and um, the commander. And he says, you know, the commander says, you know, I'm sorry if I leaned on you. And he says, oh, don't, don't worry about it, Skipper. She chose the right man. And they're all, ta, because they're friends and everything, and shipmates. So, you know, he can die now. <laughs> and he does. There we go. Gets picked up by it and thrown to the ground. Threw him to the ground. Uh, looks like the Cave of Wonders. Wind Grace has got such an amazing memory that uh, he just knows everything. And uh, if it's all these references that I, I, I can't think of. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm sure it's something, you know, Famous. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, anyway, so they're shooting away at it, uh, but there we see right. He's asleep in his in his lab, and we see all the gauges. Not all of them, but about I don't know half of them maybe. Um, are all going off. So the the planet or the machine? Oh, is it from Aladdin? Oh, right. I think I've seen that once. The the Disney Aladdin. You know, um, I think I've seen it once. I wasn't a big fan of it to be honest. My son loved it, but uh, I'm not a big fan of Aladdin. Never have been. Don't know why. Uh, anyway, uh, so he's asleep, and uh, all the machines are going off. Uh, the planet is just giving him as much power as he needs to create, you know, the monster. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, but then he hears a scream. We hear Altera scream, and it wakes him up. And he's looking round, and a nice little touch as he wakes up. All the dials all, all go, you know, go dark, which is cool. Uh, so anyway, she's had a dream, and I'm thinking, well, well maybe, maybe it was her, not him, <laughs> uh, doing it because she's had a dream that the the camp were under attack by some, you know, something horrible. And uh, there we go. Uh, so she dreamed about it. Oh, it could have been both of them. Maybe it were both of them attacking the, the camp. I don't know. Or maybe she's just cycling. Because she was connected with the animals. Maybe she's connected with the machine and she could just see what the machine were doing. I don't know. But anyway. Uh, but uh, she's saying, protect him. You know, and he says, I can't protect him as long as he stays here so willfully. But anyway. Right, so he's telling the crew, well, we fought it off, and but get ready, it might come back. And then he talks to the Ostro, and he said, do you believe that? He says, no, we didn't beat it. It just went away for some reason. Um, anyway, 
But they said, now we've got to get to that lab and take that brain boost that um, Morbius had. So, oh, and this is where he has his, his theory about uh, how it could survive being in the force field and being shot at by three billion or trillion or whatever electron volts. Um, he says it must be made of pure nuclear material and it would just fall to the centre of the planet under its own weight unless um, it were uh, recreating its uh, molecular structure microsecond by microsecond, which takes us back to the image of Altair being in... in um, been alive in Morbius's mind from microsecond to microsecond, so that's that's the clue in th that it's Morbius that were doing it all. They were renewing its molecular structure. Anyway, so they're going to go back and basically they're going to go to the Morbius's house and grab him and take off. That's what they're going to do because it's that's the regulation. <coughs> oh, pardon me, that's the regulation. Let me have a drink. Hey. Should do a never mind section thirty one film. They should do a section eighty six A film, shouldn't they? <laughs> anyway, um, so but then he's reminded that the Bellerophon expedition um, that ship was vaporized when they tried to take off. So he says that's mean. That's why we've got to go and get that brain boost. So off they go in the in the tractor. He leaves the bosun uh, in charge. Uh, uh, is it Boat Wayne? I don't know. They leave the bosun in charge. They're pulling out. They're going to get every, all the equipment back on the ship. And um, the, the, you know, the, they're leaving Altair for. But uh, in they go. Right, so. We see Robbie's monitored not to allow anybody to come in. Um he says, well, let's try reasoning with him. So they get the guns out, but Robbie neutralises their guns. Uh, how's it going to show it? Uh, my beams are focused on your blasters, gentlemen. Uh, so he does that. Cool. Note, he's deactivated their blasters. I don't know if it's permanently, because he gets it out again later on, but he doesn't shoot it, but anyway. Um, but then he says, isn't this thing programmed not to wring our necks? And then, but... Robbie says, yes, sir, but I am monitored not to allow you to enter. I don't know how he'd stop him, but anyway. But she says, you know, emergency cancellation, Archimedes, whatever. So he sods off. So he says, come on, we're going, we're leaving. Go, and while they're talking, he sneaks off into the Krell lab. Um, hopefully it's unlocked, or maybe he remembered the combination. Maybe he saw it earlier on, but anyway, whatever, he gets in. And um, they're all being all lovey dovey look. Uh, Ostro, oh, uh, as they're doing that, um, as Robbie comes back out with Ostro in his arms. There we are. Um, I think we can see the wires. <laughs> I think I think we can see. Oh, is it, it's not a dummy, no. I'm sure we can see the wires holding Ostro up. No, we can't, can we? Maybe they've been erased. Um, I concur on the Cave of Wonders. I can't remember. I've seen it. Like I'm not a big fan of Aladdin, but um, it was a lion, wasn't it? Yes, it was like a lion's head, wasn't it? The be at the beginning, yes, like a lion. So yes, it did. Yes, it did look like it. Yes. Yes. Who dares disturb my slumber? That's the Cave of Wonders, isn't it? Is it? Anyway. Right, so he's taking the brain boost as Ostro, and we see he's not well, and he's got marks on his, his temples and his forehead, and he says his, his brain's been boosted, he says it's up there in lights, bigger than his, and then he tells him to watch out for monsters from the id. Uh, there we go. Um, they was telling him about the, what the Krell did, it was the power of true creation, anything they thought manifested, um, but, uh, you know... But didn't um, they didn't count on monsters from the id? So there we go. And then he dies. So, but then Morbius comes in in his. Has he been painting or something? He's been doing something. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> in his artist cloak. Um, so it, it shows no remorse. He says, "Oh, he's a fool," and she's like, "He's dead." Uh, she calls him Morbius for some reason, but um, he said the father. 
But um, anyway, so it, she's made the decision. She's leaving with the commander. And um, so he tries to explain to Morbius what's going on. And he says, uh, you know, it's you, Morbius. It's um, that's what happened to the um, the Krell. You know, even you know they might have been amazing, but even they came from, um, you know, primitive um, ancestors. You know, the, the 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 animal inside each where every one of us, and that's what were unleashed as soon as the machine was switched on. All the Krells, all hidden thoughts and t night terrors and everything just came to life and just were manifested and just killed them instantly. That's what happened. Forbidden Planet Two, monsters from the ego. But anyway, the Klystron again. They're using that word again, Klystron relays. I like that word, don't they? But anyway, so there we go. So that's what killed them. And then, um, creation by mere thought. But then he says, ah, but hang on. The last Krell died, you know, 2,000 centuries ago. And he says, it's you, Morbius, you silly sod. Don't you know anything? He says, oh, my poor Krell. Anyway. But then he says, the last Krell died 2,000 centuries ago. But there's still a living monster. And he says, it's you, you silly old bugger. Anyway, Robbie says, there's something approaching from the south, southwest, or whatever. <laughs> Southeast, I don't know. Sand people, or worse. Here we see the invisible Krell monsters coming through the trees. We can't see it. But we see the trees moving. So it does the... Uh, Shield thing, the what they call shutters. Uh, she's gained a bit of her own initiative, and that's why she referred to him as Morbius instead of father. She's like, He's no father of mine anymore. But then Robbie called him Morbius as well, so they're all, they're all, you know, dropping him, uh, they're ditching him. Uh, anyway. I think I don't think she's human. I think she's a robot. I think he's used his Krell knowledge and recreated like a humanoid robot. She's Robbie two point oh. That's what she is. <laughs> uh, anyway, right. So, uh, a need monsters heading for them, and um, all right. He tells Robbie to kill it, but obviously that. Because it's a manifestation of Morbius's subconscious, he can't. So he's, he's blows all his fuses, uh, and it's getting in through the. Um, there we go. A bit of stop motion or whatever, getting through the, uh, through the 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 shutters. So the head for the lab, and he he uh, he closes the thing and he, he jumbles the uh, the uh, combination, uh, so it can't get in, because it you know he says. Whatever you know, that it knows. So that's why he's jumbled the combination. And um, so he's, he's, he's just telling him, you know, what's uh, that it's all his fault. It, you know, it's not deliberately so, you know, but he's trying to make him understand. But it, Morbius doesn't want to, you know, admit that he's responsible for all these deaths, uh, even though, he, you know, he didn't do it consciously. Uh, meanwhile, all the gauges are lighting up, except for them ones, for some reason. Maybe the bulbs are gone, I don't know. The gauges are lighting up because it's trying to get in through the door. Uh, so where it's telling him, you know, your subconscious sent your monster out again. More deaths, Morbius, more murder. Anyway, so he's like, guilty, guilty, giving all this Shakespeare and stuff. Anyway, the the thing's trying to get in it thinks it's um qui-gon with his lightsaber in the phantom menace they said look at these gauges the machine will give you know you your monster all the power it needs to get through that door and it was, it's turning red hot because liam neeson is on the other side with his lightsaber just before the droid arrive <laughs> there it is and then it's it it's going to melt, it's going to melt his way through, look. It's going to get them. Uh, and this is where he gets his uh, he gets his gun out, gets his blaster out, does uh, Adams. Um, so this is where he's realised. So he gets his gun out, but we saw Robbie neutralise it. Unless it was just temporary, I don't know. But, but um, 
is saying it. I'm guilty. Oh, no. My evil self is at that door. I have no power to stop it. Anyway, the door's melting. Look. Uh, so he basically just throws himself at the mercy of his subconscious and it, it kills him uh, off screen. Um, it'd be nice if we saw him get, you know, splattered or whatever. Or just bl do a, what they call them guys? I forgot, the corridor crew or whatever they call them. Do a like R-rated version of that scene. You saw blood spraying everywhere or something. I don't know. <laughs> But obviously, then more it kills itself. It's Frankenstein has killed its monster, has killed its creator, whatever, etc. Uh, so Morbius dies, and then obviously, because that happens, all the gauges turn off. Um, uh, or he's dying, should I say, because he's got one last thing to say. And uh, they go over to him, and he says, turn that disc and do this stuff. And it's a self-destruct. Still counts as the S word. Sorry, can't say that. No, he can't. There's self deletion, you've got to say, and stuff like that, haven't you? <laughs> uh, she should have just held up a hand uh, and looked at it and said, No! Like Darth Vader. <laughs> oh, dear. But this is subconscious. You can't help what you think, can you? So, you know, it's still there. You know, it's like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. That's what it is, isn't it? <laughs> I couldn't help it. It just popped in there. Anyway, so it's showing them how to uh, start the um, self-destruct thing that'll blow up the entire planet. So they could be a hundred million miles away. So off they go. There you go. He presses the. Uh, there you go. That's. Uh, it's not quite alien, is it? <laughs> it's no, similar. Right. So they all get on the ship. Um, somehow we learn that he's dragged Robbie the robot. Robbie. Of the robot, there you go, onto the ship and changed all his fuses. But anyway, uh, I was going for Neo, not Vader. <laughs> oh, ah, yes, Neo, with his, stopping his bullets and stuff, or stopping the um, sentinels. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so Robbie's the astrogator now. Obviously, changed his fuses, and they're all happy, even though everybody's no, well, several people are dead. Uh, including her father, and they're going to look at the main viewer, and then we're going to see Altair for blow up um, in a minute. <laughs> um, there you go. So nobody will be able to access the great machine of the Krell anymore. There it is. And um, he says, you know, even if a million years from now we get to the level of the Krell, we'll know that we're not God and all that stuff. Um, yes, they're all happy. <laughs> Even though there'd be death and destruction of people dying. But anyway, so off they go, flying into space. It's themed, it's the end, and it's an amazing film and all that stuff. I love it. I love, I love Forbidden Planet. I do. I love it. Let's have a look at the C fifty seven D for a minute. Hey, it's a great film. It's a great film. It is. It is. It's it's a, a thoughtful science fiction film, isn't it? It's got a monster and it's got lasers and blasters, whatever you want to call them, uh, and all that stuff and drama and you know, romance and all. It's got everything on it, and it's got that MGM shine on it. MGM at the the height of their you know filmmaking prowess, uh, in full colour, uh, with a big budget. Anyway, time to laugh around the bridge after 23 crew died. Yes, it's one they didn't like just stop on a, a, you know, a freeze frame where they're all going, ha! like the end of um, each episode of Police Squad or something. <laughs> joy, joy, yes. Well, it's the same at the end of Star Trek, isn't it? Each, end of each episode, you know, numerous red shirts have died, but they're always on the bridge laughing at the end. Aren't they? But anyway, because they're still alive... Uh, the survivor's guilt will kick in later. But anyway, as I said, uh, uh, a thoughtful science, uh, kind of thoughtful science fiction film, um, I said, made by a studio at the height of its power. Um, and uh, it's a, 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 a genuine classic that inspired stuff to come. Uh, as I've said, in you know, um, as we've been going through it. 
Time for new MGM Stargate so they could replace the circle around the line with the gate. Yes, I, well, I said that, didn't I? I said that a while ago. Stop stealing my ideas. We, <laughs> we laugh in the face of death. Yes, we do. Uh, you've got to sometimes, haven't you? You've got to. But yes, MGM get some new Stargate up. <clears throat> I mean, how much did they spend on Fallout? And it were good, yes, but it's not Stargate, is it? And that's Amazon, MGM Studios. Get Stargate doing. If you can do Fallout, you can do Stargate. Anyway, that's by the by. Right, so that's the end of Forbidden Planet. Uh, next up was um, Invisible Boy, which I've not seen. I never got round to watching it. Uh, it's on this. <laughs> uh, it's probably on YouTube. But it's not really connected. It's got Robbie the Robot in, but um, anyway, but that's the only connection. Um, sorry, I'm Harlan Ellison. You caught me <laughs> stealing my ideas, just like he stole the idea. But then kicks off when people, you know, do his stuff. Anyway, right. Let's get rid of that. There we go. Right, so we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. Great film. I love it. I love uh, Forbidden Planet. I've watched it many times. Uh, just a minute, I'm just sorting stuff out. There we go. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry I missed Friday's show. I was sick. All right, well, you were missed. You was missed. It was mentioned. <laughs> um, uh, hope you're all right now. Hope you're all right now. Um... It was a good show. I enjoyed it. Was it? Let's say Alien. Let's say it's still there if you want to watch it. It's still there. And I feel similar with Alan Moore. It's all it's a misery as well. In it? like I say, some um, I, I might be the same. I don't know, but um, you can, they get too precious with their with their properties, don't they? A lot of writers. Uh, Dan O'Bannon, he was the same, but. Uh, he gets mad when people don't make their own characters, yet his most popular thing is LXG. Uh, yes, that says, I don't think he's liked anything that's been adapted from his work, has he? But uh, anyway, glad you're better. Yes, glad you're better. Right, so we'll leave it there. What's coming up next on Friday? Wednesday's my news, isn't it? Friday... Appointment with fear. We're doing ginger snaps. The first one. Um, there we go. That one. That's what we're doing on Friday and next Monday. On. Next Monday's um, um, magnificent Mondays. We're doing Watership Down, the original 1978 cartoon that um, scarred the childhood of many a young person, including me. I saw that at the cinema twice. When I was a kid. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, all better for a good weekend. Uh, watch the show this week. I love Alien. Yes, I do. It's cool. It's cool. So that's what's coming up anyway. Um, uh, um, I've forgotten already. <laughs> uh, Ginger Snaps, Watership Down. Um, and then at the beginning of May, May the 4th, we've got the Saturday special where we're doing the original Star Wars. Um, original, have they made another? Watership Down, yes. Uh, BBC and Netflix did a, a, a CG animated version, uh, which, in my opinion, wasn't very good, but my son likes it. Uh, Ginger Snaps is a great, very underrated movie. Yes, it's good. I don't mind the sequels either to Ginger Snaps. Um, they're, they're good as well. The Ginger Snaps Unleashed and Ginger Snaps Back, or whatever they call it. Uh, they're, they're decent as well. Right, so we'll leave it there. So thanks, uh, Joshua Knapke and Wind Grace and Josh Temple. And do we have anybody else? I don't think... Uh, oh, and Tim Rose. And I don't think Sci-Fi Quest made it tonight, did he? Did he? Uh, no, I don't think he did. Uh, oh, and Archmage Frey, that mysterious man from Twitch, and my sole Patreon. <laughs> uh, let's get that up again, by the way. Let's, let's plug me Patreon. Uh, shout out to my patrons. Okay, only one so far. <laughs> but uh, anyway, links in the description. Uh, I uploaded something new yesterday. Another, another um, uh, mag uh, in magical monochrome. Hang on, where are we? What, what have I put that on for? Go away. Stop it. <laughs> 
doing chat from a million years ago. Anyway, right, so we're going now. So thanks, everybody. Um, don't forget, hit that super thanks and stuff like that. <laughs> But um, we'll leave it there. So thanks for watching. Wherever you are, look after each other. And until next time, I'll see you there.